Welcome to Scandal Water, where the tea is hot and the conversation lively. Your hosts, Candy and Ashley, will discuss a peculiar story somehow related to the entertainment industry. This podcast might not change the world, but it just might satisfy your thirst for an intriguing tale. Oh, it's that time of day. Tune in and hear what the ladies say. It's time to bend your ear when the silver screen appears. Stories about the stage and screen and everything in between. So come on and join the fun. The curtain opens in three, two, one. Stories and scandal water. It's where you need to be. Stories and scandal water. Let's pour you a cup of tea. Morning, Ashley. It's been a little while since we've done this. It's kind of fun getting to see you in a different way than we normally do this. And we have a really special guest today. This is something that we've worked on setting up for a little while because we've both been really excited about this opportunity. But the gentleman that we are talking to actually lives in a different state. So it took a little finagling. He's also very, very busy. He has a very busy schedule. We are going to be talking to Kurt Toflin, the man behind Shakespeare Behind Bars today, guys. This is really exciting to me to learn more about this program. Me too. And it's kind of personal for me, I think. I actually taught in a school less than a mile from the prison where this originated, where this program originated. I have friends and family members. We have a dear friend, Michelle, who's who's involved with working in the prison system. You know, she's a leader. She's a leadership position. As I was saying, family, friends, but we're also people. I'm an English major. Uh, we both act. So Shakespeare, you know, we have a deep respect for him. I love bringing those two worlds together and thinking about the power of Shakespeare in that particular setting. It's just, it's just fascinating to me. I couldn't have said I mean, it better myself. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to talking to Kurt here in a minute, but first let's give you guys a brief intro because it's Mr. very Tom, impressive. It's very impressive. Yes. This resume, you hold on to your hats. Okay. This is not everything, but just hitting a few highlights. Kurt has worked in the professional theater since he graduated with his MFA in acting from the University of Minnesota back in 1978. He served as the producing artistic director of the Kentucky Shakespeare Festival from 1989 to 2008. Mm -hmm. It was while he was doing that work in 1995 that he created Shakespeare Behind Bars at the Luther Luckett Correctional Complex in LaGrange, Kentucky, where they recently celebrated their 29th anniversary season with their 28th. Shakespeare production, as you like it. Shakespeare Behind Bars is internationally acclaimed and was the subject of a critically acclaimed documentary by Philomath Films that premiered at the 2005 Sundance Film Festival and went on to premiere at over 40 films around the world, winning 11 film awards. Philomath Films and Shakespeare Behind Bars are collaborating again on a new documentary, Shakespeare Beyond Bars. Kurt has led countless workshops in prisons for male, female, and LGBTIQA plus adults and juveniles, first in Kentucky, then in Western Michigan, where he now resides, and Illinois, as well as internationally in Australia and New Zealand. That's a lot. That is a lot. And and there's so much more that he's going to be able to tell us about when we go talk to him right now. We are here now with Mr. Kurt Toffland. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's just such a wonderful idea, this program. What was it that first inspired you to start Shakespeare Behind Bars? So the mission of Shakespeare Behind Bars is to offer theatrical encounters with personal and social issues to incarcerated, post-incarcerated, marginalized, and at-risk communities, allowing them to develop and expand life skills that will support their reintegration into society. And that came out of a vision of Shakespeare Behind Bars, which is inspired by the belief that all human beings are born inherently good, although some convicted criminals have committed heinous crimes against other human beings. The inherent goodness is not negated by their criminal deeds. Their goodness can be called forth by immersing the participants in a sanctuary of a circle of truth and its creative process. Uh, And 
that comes out of a belief that the participation in Shakespeare Behind Bars program can effectively change our world for the better by influencing one person at a time, awakening him or her or they or them to the power and the passion of the goodness that lives within all of us. The philosophy uh, of Shakespeare Behind Bars is that all citizens, incarcerated or not, have an authentic voice that is their strength. This voice can find renewed relationships to self and society through art, theater, specifically in our work, the collected works of William Shakespeare and original writing. And each circle member becomes a theater artist who finds expression in Shakespeare for the intellectual, emotional, physical, and spiritual as a way of speaking for themselves the deepest and perhaps the most impermeable truths of their being. Shakespeare writes on all four levels of being, cognitive, emotional, spiritual, and metaphysical. And all depth of meaning is contained in these four arenas. So this was my own personal human life pursuit. This was my own personal journey as an artist, as a uh, thespian, um, as a singer, as a, 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 a poet. Um, and I just took what I was pursuing because I didn't think I was unique or special and then began to develop uh, the vision and philosophy and ultimately the mission. Well, as an artist, you know, who was so involved, we, we read your resume, so impressive. You, you, were, you had your, your finger in so many different things. What, what made you think, I want to take this to the prisons? Like, what was it that inspired you to do that? Great question. And I think it comes out of, uh, uh, no, I don't think. I know it comes out of my, uh, my youth my family, my community, my church. Um, I was raised in right in the heartland of North Dakota on the grass prairie lands that used to be home to millions and millions and millions of buffalo bison, actually. And being raised in a in a compassionate and empathic home, church, community, where we took care of each other. There were only about 65, 70 people in my little town. I went to school with four kids in my grade, up through eighth grade, and uh, I'm the eldest of five children. So all of these are the foundation for developing me as a human being in the way that I saw the world. And also, because there's only seven year difference between me and my younger brother, I was uh, constantly told by my parents to, cause they needed help, you know, five kids in seven years. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. And, 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 uh, uh, well, not insane, but that's, that's, it's that's, a lot. that's a lot. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, I, I'm, I, I became very early on overly responsible and mm -hmm. overly responsible, not just for myself, but mostly for taking care of people. Mm -hmm. So when I got to school and, and, and started having those experiences, my heart always gravitated towards the outsiders, the, you know, the, the chubby kid that was ridiculed for being fat, the kid that wasn't very coordinated, that couldn't play softball or baseball or basketball very well, or the kid that had had academic struggles, uh, uh, and the kid that, you know, was the outsider. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I always felt responsibility to befriend them, to be, to be a friend to them, because I found that they were so much more interesting because their life background was so different from mine and their educational experience was so different from mine that uh, I, I, I was fascinated by seeing through their eyes, which of course led to me being interested in theater, uh, of inhabiting characters and playing characters that were not me, that maybe had a biographical connection, but then I had to use my dramatic imagination to fill in the blanks because I wanted to create the most truthful character that I could mm -hmm create. So these these contributed as as I moved out and into the profession, I became a teaching artist because one way to earn a living in in this business professional theater is through teaching. I came from teachers. My parents both escaped their family farms by becoming teachers and so it's in my it's in my DNA. In being a teaching artist, I developed a reputation in Kentucky. I moved to Kentucky in 1979 and I developed a reputation for being a teaching artists that wanted to work with the kids that were in the room down the hall. Mm -hmm. the, you know, they had a ADHD or ADD. They had developmental problems. They had emotional problems. They had uh, attention problems. They had sometimes physical challenges and stuff. I just wanted to be in that room because I didn't, it's not that I didn't think the, the, the main classroom 
needed creative activities or what I was teaching and offering, but I just felt that that population needed it more. So that developed then eventually uh, when I became the producing artistic director of Kentucky Shakespeare Festival, which is the oldest free festival in North America in Louisville, mm -hmm. I created an education department. And in the education department, I wanted to take Shakespeare to uh, middle and high schools, but then upper elementary and finally down into the lower elementary. And, and I didn't want to negate those in, in the schools that uh, were, again, labeled negatively and were problems. And eventually, when you're working with that population, it leads you to working with kids in the street that the education system has failed. And when you start working with the street kids, the kids that have dropped out, the kids that are marginalized, uh, uh, then you eventually find your way to juvenile detention because when they go awry of the law, society's laws, they end up in juvenile detention under the order of the court. I started going there and working with them. And then it's just an, again, it's kind of a natural mm -hmm. journey right. to, to finding my way into adult corrections. Mm, fascinating. It really is. I would say then if on this journey to adult corrections, the first thing that I think our listeners would want to know then is, did you ever feel that your personal safety was in danger when you were working with them? You know, it's a great question. And, and it's a question that's very common because the public doesn't really have any real understanding of what prison is. They don't know who we lock up. They think they're all one kind. They're all villains. They all deserve to be there. There's nobody that's innocent of a crime that they've committed. I didn't really carry those same bodies biases into the prison. I, I wasn't going to do something crazy, but I also knew that prisons are, you know, they, they, there's a lot of officers around. There's a lot of protections. And particularly if you're a volunteer coming in and working, the cameras are on you. Sometimes you even have a staff member that's in the room. You're given a radio, you can call for help, you know. And, and so I, I didn't really have a, an overt fear of that. And I can happily say that um, in 30 years of doing this work, I've, I have uh, never experienced any personal safety concerns. That's great. Awesome. Now, I'm also, you know, six foot two and, and, and 225 pounds. So, wow. you know, I'm not a small person, yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, that, and needless to say, that doesn't stop people, but if they're going to commit violence. But what quickly happens is, is you develop a relationship with the, with the individuals who show up mm -hmm. and, and, and in that group, in that circle, it becomes a family. And so I always felt I had protection all around me that if anything erupted in in uh, the classroom or in a rehearsal, uh, that I had plenty of guys that had my back. I wasn't afraid to go out on the yard because the guys were walking with me normally on the yard. And uh, again, I, I probably have felt more danger from correctional officers than I've felt from prisoners. Also in other interviews, you have made the comment that hurt people hurt people. Can you share with us how that belief has influenced your approach working with the prisoners? Yeah. So I tried to track down, I've heard that statement a lot. I tried to track down and finally what it came up with is it's a, it's an anonymous statement. We don't know who said it first, but I love that. I just love it's short and sweet and it tells the, the the truth, like in the circle of truth. Over the years, I'm, I'm not trained as a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a sociologist. However, I am trained as an artist and an artist explores human behavior through the aesthetic. So I'm deeply, deeply steeped in human behavior, in characters in a play. But when you're steeped in that and trained in that, it allows you then to look to the real world and to see things. And then I've taken many classes in psychology, I even thought about becoming a clinical psychologist psychologist uh, or or becoming uh, 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 somebody that had a drama therapy degree and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, so, and I've taken many workshops and I also been in practice now working in juvenile correction since 1991, which goes even beyond starting the adult program in 95. So a long time, but I developed a trauma-informed practice. Trauma-informed now is a is, is pretty much a buzzword uh, because of the Me Too movement, because of COVID-19, because of a lot of things that have happened recently. And, you know, for me as an, as an old hippie and a product of the 60s and early 70s, it's like it's about time. So I had to develop a trauma-informed 
practice, uh, something that I was doing anyway, but I had to articulate it. And one of my mentors is Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Um, and he wrote uh, probably one of the foremost books on trauma, and it's called The Body Keeps the Score. Oh, yes. And, yeah. and it's a brilliant book, and it's written not, he's a, he's a, he's a scientist, you know, and has, has been working with human behavior, started his career in, in the VA, which many do, working with vets coming back from Vietnam and dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. But he's a big proponent of the arts and incorporating the arts and and, uh, and I love him and I love his work. So he said uh, a quote that I use, trauma happens to everyone, mm -hmm. but the way you respond to it determines its impact on your brain and body. Mm -hmm. um, and many human beings suffer some form of trauma in their lives, mm -hmm. even in the best of homes, even in the best of situations. It's all about a varying degree. And in the more impoverished sectors of our community, racism, poverty, domestic abuse, street violence, addiction, absent fathers, and many other related traumas get dumped on our most vulnerable populations. And our most vulnerable populations end up being the highest percentage that are in prisons. Cahil Gibran said, uh, this this goes back to, I read him in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, so, uh, but I love his work. And he says, many of us spend our whole lives running from feeling with the mistake and belief that you cannot bear the pain, mm -hmm. but you have already borne the pain. And what you have not done is feel all you are beyond that pain. So mm -hmm. unintegrated experience, trauma is unique for each person who suffers it. Anguish or despair or grief can't be compared. And there's no comparable measurement tool for whose pain and trauma is worse or more difficult to bear. Another of my favorite authors, Eric Tolle, says, as long as you make an identity for yourself out of pain, you cannot be free of it. Mm -hmm. And a common social belief is that children are born innocent and uncorrupted, but some children are born into environments that are toxic, corrosive, and dangerous. And the skills they learn in such environments are all too often coping skills, not life skills. Mm -hmm. Another author, Richard Rohr said, if we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it, usually to those closest to us, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, and invariably the most vulnerable are children. Mm -hmm. So a very high percentage of the prison population has experienced heartbreaking, life-shattering childhood experiences of intentionally inflicted trauma, including willful abuse and conscious neglect. And I'm a Jungian uh, Jung, Jung for, for many of you might know that was a, a, a co-practitioner with Freud, but then they diverged and they went their separate way. Carl Jung took a different vent, uh, approach and that was towards metaphor and which being an artist, that's the world that, that I live in. And Carl Jung says, nothing has a stronger influence psychologically on their environment and especially on their children than the unlived life of the parent. That's how trauma gets passed on from parent to child. Penitentiaries, jails, and detention centers are society's scrap heap. They are the dumping ground and the epicenter of unresolved trauma, abuse, and guilt in our world. Prisons dispose of the human being, not the crime. For the human beings who find themselves confined within the boundaries of institutional correction, innate goodness still lives. This is SBB. It's still in there. And space must be created for the human goodness to be called forth. And finally, Viktor Frankl, another of my mentors, um, Viktor Frankl survived the concentration camp and created a whole whole uh, philosophy and a whole theory of, of psychotherapy, said between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom. Mm -hmm. So I had the good fortune to watch the Shakespeare Behind Bars documentary as part of my research. I thought it was fascinating. I would highly recommend it to our listeners because I think those of us who don't know much about the prison system, this was so fascinating because 
it took us inside. We got to see how you worked with this one group of, of inmates who were putting on this one production. We got to see the, the whole process that you followed over the course of months with them. You mentioned earlier the relationships. I could see your relationships develop. I could see when you said they had your back. I was like, absolutely. I can see that they had your back. They had each other's backs because yeah. you had formed such a close knit bond and you had this common mission. I know that one thing that you talked about briefly was a circle of truth and how you had to, to make it safe for these people who didn't necessarily live in a place that felt safe to them, who didn't come from a background that felt very safe or very affirmed. You had to bring out a circle of truth from them. Can you give us just a few of the strategies that you use to build that circle of truth? With sure, them? absolutely. The circle of the Shakespeare Behind Bars circle of truth is a sanctuary of shared presence that uplifts truth, no matter how difficult or shameful it may be. The circle of truth truth is a place where I, as an injured human being, can join in community with other injured human beings to explore the paradoxes of our humanity. And sometimes the human beings most injured from the inside are the ones most willing to help others. The true heroes are those who, in the process of bearing their own pain, can lift up others and offer a, a reflection. In seeing myself, even the shameful part of myself, reflected. I know that I'm not alone. And in the circle of truth community, I don't have to suffer alone. I can sit on the rim of the circle and simply be broken until I decide I am ready to begin my journey into wholeness. And Parker Palmer, another favorite writer and mentor said, wholeness does not mean perfection. Mm -hmm. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. So sitting in the circle of truth, there's always invitation, never invasion, always opportunity, never demand. I am not there to fix them. I am not the white uh, Botswana that's there to rescue these poor people. I'm there. I sit in that circle to fix me. And the philosophy is, is that no one can fix you, but you. It's like when an alcoholic finally decides they're going to stop drinking for them rather than doing it for AA or for family or you, it doesn't work, never works. But when you make the decision, I'm doing this for me, that's not selfish. That's healing. So you know, sitting in the circle is not about me fixing you. It's about me helping you with tools and experiences in, in a, in, in as safe a place as we can make to learn how you can fix you. And I loved watching it again through that documentary, which I found so powerful. I loved seeing that you had them self-cast and yeah. sometimes the role they chose would be a character who actually had struggled with the very thing, the very thing that they themselves had struggled Abs with. Absolutely. Uh, or they would journal. There were so many strategies I saw where you helped them to really kind of dig deep and to wrestle with things through the course of doing this Shakespearean play. Right. And, and then they would talk to the camera and, and do these little editorials where they would comment on things. It was just, it was just so fascinating. Thank but you. that brings me to my next question. One of the fellas in the documentary, I think his name was Leonard. He shared that a challenge of doing the program is that because of the setting, you never know what, what's going to happen. You, you know, <laughs> there's always something unexpected that comes up. And he said, it seems like we're always losing somebody. You never know when somebody's <laughs> going to go to the hole or, you know, get taken out of the production. And then sure enough, poor Leonard, it happened to him. And we got to see how a new actor was brought in and had to learn the role and fill that spot. Ultimately, Leonard got to come back. But, but my question for you is, what are some interesting, maybe fun, who knows, uh, stories of unexpected things that have come up that you've had to deal with when well, dealing with You've articulated a number of them, and since, since you mentioned Leonard, I'll talk about him. He was the prisoner you sp that that you speak of. He was uh, charged with having. He worked for Prison Industries, and Prison Industries had a data program. It was very, very profitable for the Department of Corrections. Brought in millions of dollars, and Leonard happened to be from life a master's level computer programmer. So. Uh, you know, he was highly educated and he worked and entered data and on his computer was found an illegal file. And of course, corrections immediately and society assumes the worst. He's guilty. 
they, they don't give you a chance to be investigated. He's just basically simply shipped to another institution. So he, he leaves and he was playing one of the primary roles. He was later exonerated of all of those charges and uh, was brought back to Luther Luckett. Now that only happened because the DOC doesn't admit that it's wrong. Normally what would happen is he wouldn't get any charges. He wouldn't get any extra time, but he would stay at, they sent him to the, to the maximum security prison in Western Kentucky. But our our warden that you meet in the documentary, Larry Chandler, uh, doesn't believe in that, and he 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 said if he's exonerated, we're bringing him back, mm -hmm. um, and and he came back, but he didn't come back and say give me my role back because another actor had stepped in and the actor wanted to give him the role back and he said no he said you've been working on this and we've been doing performances he said uh, uh, we were starting uh, for the first time we were the first prison company in the united states that i know of that was allowed to tour our production to other prisons wow. and so we lost a couple of guys uh, over that span of time before the uh, from the end of the play until we did our first tour so he just took one on one of the roles that needed to be replaced so he came back into the production the biggest obstacle is never with the prisoner it's is always with the administration and the staff of the correctional facility pushing back against a program facilitated by a volunteer coming into the prison to work with prisoners so larry chandler and other wardens and deputy wardens and great ceos that i've worked with over the years they're 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 the antithesis of that so i don't want to paint a picture that they're all that way no it's in corrections, there's two forces at work. One is the force that believes in custody and that prison should go on punishing you until the end and you should stay there for the rest of the life for the for the bad thing that you did. And then there's the 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 other side of it, which is no, prison is about habilitation. Prison is about uh, the fact that 97% of all prisoners currently incarcerated are going to get out someday and come back to society. Society has to ask, how do we want them to come back? Do we want them to come back with, in essence, a PhD in criminology because they've learned from the best inside? Or do we want them to come back as changed? And the only way to change behavior is to change thinking. And the only way to change thinking is through programs. So these two forces are constantly at work in prison. Obviously, I'm, I believe in custody with protecting prisoners from themselves, prisoners from society. I, I, I don't push back against that. I believe in safety and custody, but the question is, how do you want them to come back? Well, you need them to come back with changed thinking, changed behavior. You want them to assimilate back into society as smoothly as they can. So he's he's an interesting case, but we've, we've lost others, you know, uh, in the last minute and uh, you just cope. And that's part of it. I never mind when that happens because it's about teaching them how to cope. Life doesn't run smoothly. So when we lose somebody like we lost Leonard, somebody else has to step up because the show's gonna go on. That's part of life is gonna go on. Mm -hmm. So you don't spend any time with the past. You only spend the time in the present and the present will lead you to the future. Ooh. I like that. Another person in the documentary that was featured that came across as really empathetic and likable was Sammy Byron, who later shared he was in, in prison for a life sentence for committing murder. Now, we have heard that Sammy is one of your return citizen success stories. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? Absolutely. Love to. So Sammy was raised in Western Kentucky. His father was Mexican and his mother was Black. And as a mixed race human being, he was an outsider and he didn't belong to either of those communities because he was too black for the brown community and not black enough for the black community. And then for the white community, he was light brown. So he wasn't he was an outsider and an outcast. Additionally, both of Sammy's parents sadly were alcoholics and they were physically and verbally abusive to each other and to the children. So at six years of old, Sammy was was sexually molested by a high school student. And when he got home, what do you do? You run you run to your parents. He ran and told his father what had happened. And his father rejected him as calling him a punk who didn't, a six-year-old, you didn't fight hard enough and you caused your own abuse. Then in middle school, Sammy was raped by a neighbor boy. Same scenario because his father had rejected him in the first incident. Sammy kept that abuse to himself. So he bottled it all up and it's all inside. This early trauma and rejection created a world of violence where he wasn't safe. That battled, bottled up rage finally exploded and he did take the life of his victim that sent him to prison, convicted on a life sentence. However, Sammy's high, as you can tell from the documentary, he's highly intelligent, uh, self-educated, brilliant, 
in so many ways. Sammy joined Shakespeare Behind Bars as a co-founding member in 1995, and he worked diligently to change his life story, his life trajectory. Fortunately for him, because of all of his good time and because of his evolution and because of, of, of his, him being able to change his thinking and change his behavior, he was paroled in 2014. He is currently a career counselor for Goodwill Industries in a program called The Spot, which deals with 18 to 25-year-olds who have come in contact with the American criminal justice system, and he's a mentor and a counselor to them. So he now views his life outside of prison as giving back. And each day he gets up and every day he gets up in the memory of his victim because he can't change that. So he grieves that and he saves lives every day. Mm, that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's switch gears then a little bit and let's start talking again about Shakespeare himself. So when you were talking about creating this program, it's Shakespeare behind bars. So when someone says, what, what do you say when someone says to you, why specifically is it Shakespeare behind bars? What made <laughs> yeah. it? That's a great question. And that's the question I get all the time because yeah. there's so many Shakespeare haters out there. <laughs> and why are they Shakespeare haters? Because they had bad teaching or no teaching. And so there's, I call it Shakespeare. And it's my job to eliminate Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to do if I'm given the opportunity to do that. People ask me all the time, hey, Kurt, where'd you learn to do this? And I said, I taught Shakespeare to public and private school, middle school students probably the toughest population on the face of the earth. <laughs> yes. And then I found an even tougher population. I started teaching Shakespeare to juveniles. That's 16, primarily 16 year old boys who are really angry at the world. The education mm -hmm. system has failed them. Society has failed them. Now they're locked up, taken away from their families and their friends and stuff. And so I, I learned on the front line of teaching Shakespeare to middle school students. So why do I use Shakespeare? Because he created 1,223 characters that populate all his tales and an impressive 34,895 speeches. And when a human being experiences trauma, oftentimes they don't have language for that trauma. They can't talk about it. Just like a, a veteran comes home from war, the only person they can talk to about war and war experiences is not a loved one. No matter how much they're loved, it's another veteran. Mm -hmm. Same thing in prison. Prison is a trauma every day. Every day is, is trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And when prisoners come home, they can't talk to their loved ones about that because there will be no comprehension of what they've experienced, but they can talk to another prisoner. So the only way to heal trauma is for the person who suffered it to have language to be able to talk about it. That's the only way to get there to healing. Well, when the trauma is so horrific and you don't have language for it, I can find language for it in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And as someone that's traumatized is speaking the language of someone, a character, an aesthetic, and that character has experienced a similar trauma, and Shakespeare is giving profoundly deep, emotionally connected, cognitively connected, empathy, compassion, all everything. The person who suffered the trauma begins to find a way using Shakespeare to articulate their personal side. And eventually in the circle of truth, where it's as safe as we can make it to talk about personal experiences, they find their words for their trauma. And in finding their words, that's where the healing comes from. You know, the national recidivism rates, roughly 67% of prisoners come back to prison within five years. Our recidivism rate at Luther Luckett over 30 years, we're in our 30th year, is 6%. And wow. I'm convinced that the reason that it's that low is because we work to change the human being. Mm -hmm. I said earlier that prison doesn't do anything about correcting the crime. It only heaps more abuse. It takes the life of the prisoner. And it, it should be a, a, a place where people can go for healing because mm -hmm. society failed them, education failed them, <clears throat> their families failed them. That's why I use Shakespeare is because I can find characters that mirror their lives. And then over time, uh, they begin to be able to talk about the trauma that happened to them. Another one of my favorite writers is Dr. James Gilligan. Jock, he, he worked in, in uh, maximum security death row mm -hmm. his, most of his career, and he, and he loved Shakespeare. So he actually worked with individuals who were like Macbeth, who were like Richard III, who were like Iago. And he's written a brilliant book, a number of brilliant books about that connection. So he supports this idea of why Shakespeare is important. And he said Shakespeare is best understood as a psychologist. In fact, he goes so far to say he was the first psychologist, even though he wasn't called a psychologist. Why? Because he's showing us how and why people 
behave and the consequences of their behavior, not as a moralist preaching to us as to how they should behave, but in helping them to inhabit a character to understand why they make the choices that they make and what the consequences of that are. Wow, that data, the recidivism rate for your program, that has to be so affirming, that that has to feel so good to see that that kind of result. And then and then the human, you know, those those humans in front of you to see them you know, get back into society and be su successful. That just has to feel so good. So you have expanded Shakespeare behind bars to include Shakespeare beyond bars, which is for return citizens. And you also have a new program, which is Shakespeare before bars, which is an intervention program. So could you just explain a little bit more about each of these projects? Yeah, happy to. So the nucleus of Shakespeare Behind Bars was working with the incarcerated. You know, after working, you know, for the past 30 years, I, we probably have close to 600 participants on the street. Wow. And they have deep needs also because oftentimes they come back and society still wants to punish them. They don't get jobs. They and and it becomes economic for them. They can't find housing. You know, there's just so many restrictions. And we don't have a lot of programming for returned citizens the way they do in other countries. And so uh it naturally when COVID locked me out of face to face, I immediately formed a virtual program. We meet every continue to meet every Tuesday Tuesday night, 5.30 to 7.30, and it's for returned citizens. And uh, also, I have a number of dear friends that are either practitioners or authors that have written about Shakespeare Behind Bars. And uh, a couple guys uh, come from Australia, a woman that's a, a PhD and a researcher did an in, did, did work with us in Michigan and in Kentucky comes from England. A number of the SBB alumni from both Michigan programs and the Kentucky programs uh, come from various states around the United States. And that's the beauty of a virtual because all they have to do is deal with the time zone. Like Laura, who comes to us from England, she, she, she's seeing us at 1130 at night, Ooh. you know, <laughs> but she's willing to do it because it's such a benefit to her. And she's such a, a gift to the circle. So the Beyond Bars is programming that is for those that have left incarceration. The newest program is Before Bars, and that comes out of trying to intervene. Each each program, so Shakespeare Behind Bars was about helping them to lead the most productive life they could lead behind bars and then to prepare them to go home so they wouldn't come back. Mm -hmm. Beyond Bars picks up where that moment that they get out is and before bars is we before they go to juvenile we would prefer to intervene mm -hmm. so this new program is going to talk to boys and girls clubs middle and high schools church groups other nonprofits that work with marginalized kids you know but it's we want to encounter them before they go to to juvenile justice and uh, and and we're even looking at working with the court system where a kid comes into the court system, but before they're sentenced to go to juvenile detentions, perhaps they could be sentenced to, to doing Shakespeare. Like mm -hmm. my friends at Shakespeare and Company created a, a Shakespeare in the Courts program. They can, were the innovators of it in this country. And uh, so a kid can be sentenced to Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> so it's lovely. So that's the before bars that, and we'll have a speakers gallery and uh, it'll be made up of uh, return citizens, not just from SBB programming, but from colleagues programs around the country, around the world. And basically, uh, no matter what population we're talking to, we can find someone in the speakers gallery that they will identify with. Like it's important for you and the audience member to look up on stage and see someone that's your color, that's your that's your gender preference, that's, you know, all, all, you know, there, there's, oh, there's a place for me because I see myself in that. So that's the idea of the speakers gallery. To wrap this up today, could you tell our listeners where they can follow you or learn more about your work or su even support you all? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. The the the, the most current is uh, we have a Facebook page. If you're a Facebook mm -hmm. member, you can go to Shakespeare Behind Bars and there's a Facebook page. We also have a website. It's Shakespeare Behind Bars, just all small cap, dot org, O-R-G. If you put in dot com, it's going to take you to Philomath Films and the mm -hmm. documentary which is not a place bad place to go but if you go .org you're going to find a plethora 
you know, hours and hours of information and data that we've published there and interviews. Your your interview once it's once it comes out, I will put a link to it on our uh, website so that people can find it if they so desire. It's where the documentary is. You can go there and click and do a direct stream from our uh, from our website. And there's also, of course. A donation page because we are a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation we raise money to give our product away for free we don't charge prisoners we don't try to charge juvenile detention centers we're literally raising all the money to provide it for free and we don't take government money from corrections we've always refused it said no i'm i'm free entity i don't want to be embodied to, uh, uh, to you or or feel like i owe you something or you think you can control me so we raise about 125 to 150,000 dollars every year year after year to support programs that are ongoing like luther luckett but also for new programming like the shakespeare before bars program that we're creating it has been just delightful talking with you. I have to say, it is so impressive. You are coming up on 30 years that you have dedicated to this program and, and, and speaking with you. And, and I will put a plug in for your website because I did do a lot of research watching, you know, reading some of the clippings and watching a lot of interviews. There's a, a wealth of information there. It's all fascinating. But all that said, it's, it's just so apparent, your heart and your passion for this work. So thank you for for everything you've dedicated to that and thank you for speaking with us we we've really enjoyed this and we really appreciate your time well i appreciate you uh, you know sharing this information with your listening public that's how we spread the news we spread the news one person to another person to another person and this is one of the best ways to do it and once it's up it's up hopefully for a very long time so our 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 you know we have a lot of grad students that are researching and writing their their masters or PhDs about arts and corrections, some of them about Shakespeare and behind bars in particular. So it's just a great resource to be able to go to and hear these interviews or read these 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 interviews or you know podcasts and all of the wonderful. And I, I should also say that I have never written a, a media release trying to get people to write about me. Like you found me through a professor who knows about the work who mentioned Shakespeare behind bars. Mm -hmm. That's the way I want it to happen because then it's organic. I'm not trying to market this. Yeah. I am trying to get the word out, but I want the word out. That's how Philomath Films. I didn't approach Philomath Films to do the documentary and we're now making a second documentary, Shakespeare Beyond Bars. They came to me because they read an article in the American theater and then reached out to me and that's how the relationship started. So it was accidental and I like those accidental things. Yes, yes, I like that too. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you, Candy and Ashley. I really appreciate your time. Well, what did you think, Ashley? Wow, he was just so lovely and so well-spoken and mm. so passionate and kind about his subject. And it really opened your eyes to things that you and I would never have thought about mm -hmm. how Shakespeare could be used. So true. And and I'm going to say it again. I felt like I knew Kurt before I came into this interview because I had watched so many of his interviews and I that documentary, it really was fascinating. So I've seen him, I feel like I've seen him work already. Yeah. And so this was another piece of it that was just so fun for me because I said it already, I'll say it again, you can feel his passion. Yes. You can feel his passion and you can also see how he is building, has built his program on so much literature and so much psychology. And so, I mean, like he's, he's, this is such a thoughtful program and I'm impressed by how it's expanding, you know, that they see a need. They're like, okay, we've seen success with helping incarcerated people be prepared to leave here. Now let's, let's help them before they ever make it to prison. Let's help them after they get out. They're trying to put themselves out of a job, you know, <laughs> trying to yeah. make the middle one be something they don't have to do anymore. But what I really liked was I especially liked hearing how he got to the point of having the idea about his mm -hmm. childhood, about he has grown up feeling like he takes care of people. He wants to take yeah. care of his heart for people is so strong. And that just seemed like such a natural progression from his childhood to what he does now. It's like this, this literally was something that was his life's here's what you're going to do with your life. And yeah. 
Here you go. This is this yeah. is for you. like dominoes just laying out. And and I also have to comment because you and I are obviously such fans of the arts. We're so involved with the arts. Isn't it beautiful to see how he's he was able, he's been able to take his his expertise and this foundation in the arts and yeah. to bring it over here to to change people's lives. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's doing. He's changing people's lives. So I have found this fascinating. I'm so thankful that Kurt found the time to talk to us. And I think we obviously know how we're going to end. Here's a big cheers to Mr. Kurt Toflin. Amazing work. Amazing work. Cheers to you. Cheers. If you love what we do, please rate and review our show. Or you can become a supporter by making a donation through buymeacoffee.com slash scandalwaterpod. Whether a single gift or a recurring monthly donation, it would go a long way towards supporting our work and allowing us to keep the tea brewing. At our website, www.scandalwaterpodcast.com, you can submit questions or your own story ideas, access our sources and show notes, see the merch we offer for sale, and more. You can Join the Scandal Water community through our Scandal Water Podcast Facebook page or follow us on Instagram or TikTok at Scandal Water Podcast. This episode was executive produced by Candy Thomas, that's me, and Ashley Raymer Brown, that's me. It was researched and written by Candy Thomas and edited by Ashley Raymer Brown. A special thank you to Josh Martin, who wrote, composed, and performed the Scandal Water theme and other music, Matt C. Adams, who created the artwork, and Joshua Reith, who designed our website and provides ongoing technical support. As a reminder, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes. The thoughts and opinions of the host during each episode of Scandal Water are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any future guests, advertisers, or clearly professional psychologists. Thanks for listening.